Okay, can you all hear me? Yes? Okay. Welcome uh, on this uh, early Tuesday morning at the IJF. Um, I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome everyone here um, in the room and also online. Um, my name is Rosanna Fanny. Um, I have been until last week a, a researcher and also um, coordinator of a project at the Center for European Policy Studies, in short SEPS, which is a Brussels-based think tank. And I'm very pleased to moderate the session today on um, our town hall, actually, on a dare to share a rebuilding trust through data stewardship. Uh, I will also uh, first thank the organizer, uh, Kevin, uh, who's here also with us, um, and also the Tony Blair Institute for uh, bringing, to bringing us here together to discuss this very important topic. And um, I will also already introduce the online moderator, um, Taina Flor Bento Mota from the um, Data Protection Authority in Brazil. She would be also online with us. So about today's session. Um, this session will focus on, as you already know, um, exploring new ways to open up uh, the value of data. In fact, as we all know, data is often referred to the new oil and also has become a double-edged sword because uh, while its abundance uh, promises innovation and progress, it also raises serious concerns about privacy control and the ethical use and reuse of data. And when I thought about the session, um, it came to my mind that data sharing is actually a little bit similar to uh, a dinner situation with friends. We all love to be invited um, to, uh, to a dinner at our friend's place. Um, the only thing we need to do is to find out how to get there, uh, maybe we can inquire what we, what we can bring for dessert, but that's about it, right? So really nice. But um, on the other hand, I assume everyone also knows how it is to um, invite friends over and uh, how much effort it takes actually to prepare a dinner. Um, you need to find a special recipe, you buy ingredients, you have to set the table, you have to do the dishes afterwards. So quite a lot of series of things that you actually need to do. And I think with data sharing, it's quite similar. Um, we all know about the value of open data and we think we need to improve the access um, and so on, but actually it's uh, challenging to get a, a functional uh, open data ecosystem um, which also respects uh, individual rights and is um, uh, compatible or um, uh, yeah, open to, to various uh, forms of data and also to various sectors. So actually not so easy um, when, you, when you think about it twice. And um, this is also visualized in the wonderful uh, data map by the Open Data Institute um, that we're now going to show on the slide. And I will all invite you to um, actually check it out yourself online because um, it's a, a wealth of uh, knowledge that is uh, in this data, uh, data map. Um, let's see if we can get it on screen. And then the link should open in just a second. Yes, and we can maybe also try to put the link in the chat later, um, or you can also find the map online if you Google open data map, I think. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and here you can see um, what looks like a, a normal map, but um, if you zoom in a little bit, um, and we can maybe zoom in in the uh, collaborator uh, big island that is in the center of the map, you can see um, that there are uh, many descriptions, so to say, of what the collaborator island actually consists of. Um, the collaborator island uh, symbolizes, so to say, um, organizations or um, uh, approaches that bring people together to collaborate around a shared component of data infrastructure, so for example, data marketplaces, data exchanges, data trusts, co cooperatives, and so on. This is what we are also going to explore today. When we maybe go a little bit more up, can we zoom a little bit in? Yeah, perfect. Exactly. We see the shared biome, for example, and the small series of islands here uh, at the north of the Collaborator uh, Big uh, Island, um, which uh, addresses approaches um, to uh, uh, research access schemes, for example, or also data philanthropies, basically. Um, models that uh, enable um, people to, to share data and, and to um, really collaborate on, on them um, through uh, ecosystems. Um, and for example, when we go to the, um, the Isle of Human, uh, to the bottom right of the map, 
um, the Isle of Human, you can also see um, this is basically approaches that um, uh, enable humans to share data amongst each other and that incentivizes uh, people to, to uh, open up, so to say, their, their data um, sets. Um, for example, through personal data representatives, data lockers, individual data donation, and so on. And uh, there are also some uh, interesting <laughs> um, other areas. For example, you have at the bottom uh, uh, left center the, the private cove or the forbidden isle. So the pirate cove is um, consists of approaches that actually are illegal, so hacking, theft, which is, however, also a form of data sharing, unfortunately. Um, and you have also the side steppers, for example, which is a, a region that um, uh, has a, a legitimate means of gaining access to closed data. So um, that mm, approaches that aim to provide people or organizations with ways of gaining access to data that the current data holder or steward would otherwise designate, designate off limits. So um, yeah, I invite you to explore this map um, further. I think it's a, a great piece of work and it's also uh, very nicely designed. So thanks again to the Open Data Institute. And with that, I think um, we're already right into the topic. And so um, I will just maybe quickly uh, say that the se uh, session is structured around three key policy questions. Um, and I will introduce each of the policy questions before handing over to our distinguished panelists. We have pairs of two. And then at the uh, end of the panelists, we have uh, 30 minutes more or less for question and answers. Okay, so the first key policy question that we would like to answer today or get an insight on is um, about uh, the role of data governance stakeholders. So um, mm, we would like to ask what should be the respective role of data governance stakeholders in promoting responsible data sharing, for example, stimulating experimentation and innovation in data governance design, monitoring and evaluating different data governance approaches. And for that, we have two distinguished speakers. Um, Jack Hardinges, who is, oh, okay, one. Ah, yeah, okay, so sorry. <laughs> so we have one speaker on site. Um, Asta Kapoor from the APTI Institute. And thank you so much for joining us, such an early hour. And the floor is yours. Yeah, um, thank you for this and thank you for the audience too uh, for coming at this very early hour. Um, I guess to start off with the policy question, I think that we're trying to understand what we want to do here and what we want to do here is to make sure that the value of data is realized at several different levels. One is at between individuals or at the individual level. The second one is um, between individuals. So, you know, if you want to share data with like almost like a P2P transaction. The third one is within communities. So if uh, members of a community want to share data between each other, then that should be possible. Um, and then, you know, you sort of build up to that. And at the moment, um, the regulation actually looks at individual data rights in their relationship with platforms and government. And so as we think about the systems that need to be built both from the policy perspective but also from the institutional perspective, I think that we need to think about it more from a bottom-up mechanism and to understand how individuals interact with data when it comes to interactions with each other as well as in the groups that we occupy. So just as an example, um, you know, we do a lot of work with cooperatives and what we're under trying to understand as women who occupy these cooperatives is a couple of things. The cooperative for instance, in the context of India, will incur agricultural labor together. They make decisions on agriculture also together. Um, they will um, distribute benefits from the board to all the members, and those are all collective decisions and collective governance. But when it comes to banks seeking data from members of the cooperative, they break down these institutional boundaries and they interact with the individual only because financial institutions that are defined by the, you know, individual access to finance and individual data can only deal with them at the individual level. So the bank will then 
aggregate all of this and see, okay, fine, you as a group can get this loan or that loan, et cetera. And invariably, it doesn't reflect the meaning of the entire group. So we've been trying to, and also in return, what you get is uh, products that are not meant for you, you get interest rates that are much higher than what you'd be willing to pay, or what you also get, and this is an example that we've seen very many times, is that women also don't understand the data that they need to make certain kinds of decisions. So a cooperative that we work with needs to procure seeds, um, but they don't understand what the, the amount of seeds that they need, et cetera, so they have no way of pooling demand from their members as well as a data question. So what the point I'm trying to make is that there are multiple group decisions that happen with regard to data, and there are existing institutions that also have historically enabled groups to come together and decide. What we are seeing in the data economy is that a complete Blind, it has, has been completely blind, blindsided by the existence of groups in our real world. And these groups are not just offline groups like the ones that I mentioned, but you know whether it's Facebook, and you know everyone uses that example, but whether it's Facebook, what they also do is they put us into groups that we don't even understand. So there are groups of you know women with dark hair or women with light hair, and then they, you know, put out products for us on our platforms in the same, in, as a group, they are not interested in individual level data. They're also organizing us in certain kinds of groups. It's just that we don't know how the algorithm has defined us. So as we start to think about data rights and you know what policy changes are required, I think that the idea of straddling some kind of group rights is definitely necessary. There's a lot of work that has happened on group privacy. Uh, there's a lot of work that has happened on, you know, in particularly in bioethics around ideas of data banks and biobanks because those are collective instruments and they need to be. But I think what we really need to think about is how do we codify this in existing laws? And you'll see it in the GDPR, I can speak for the India context, and several other legislations are looking at individual rights, and they're looking at um, the idea that you know individuals will consent, and that'll be the end of that. However, um, there are some legislations, or at least legislative conversations that are coming up. I know that in one of the alphabet soups of the EU, I think it's the DGA, mentions data cooperatives. Um, in the context of India, there was uh, an interesting government report that came out a year and a half or two years ago on non-personal data, which had a problematic definition that all data that is not personal is non-personal. Uh, but uh, what they were trying to do is also think about community rights and to say that Communities are can be both harmed and helped with the use of data, and so how do we define communities? But unfortunately, uh, while this island has very nice segregations, the human life is quite messy, and so um, you know we don't have clear segregations around where communities end, begin. The individuals in this room are a community of individuals in this room, but then could also, when, you know, all the tech that we have here impacts us in some way. Voices are being recorded, faces are being recorded. Uh, but, but, you know, we also occupy multiple different communities at the same time, and so I as an individual might want to have a huge amount of control on the school community of my kid, which is, you know, because I'm also a guardian for her data, uh, whereas I may not want to be as involved in other kinds of data that I need. And in this context, different models of data stewardship uh, become interesting because what we are trying to solve for is greater pooling of data rights and then the next step is thinking about what those institutional mechanisms that allow for pooling of data rights are and also allow for a change of mind. Today I want to be involved, tomorrow I don't want to be involved. Um, and there are some models that have been you know, discussed over time. There's data trust, which we've looked at quite extensively, and I think that you know, setting up of new institutions is, is potentially hard to do, um, but but I think the next set of questions is, how do we think about 
existing institutions and you know I like cooperatives that um, that can be made more resilient that can be made more able to understand what these group dynamics are and how they can be actualized in the context of the digital economy I think policy is a little way off because I think this is a complex question and and what we know from policy documents so far is that you know everyone goes after the easiest least terrible thing to say and so I think that we need to at least in the couple of years that we have before this conversation really blows up is actually start to see what those instantiations of these group rights are and how we can um, how we can actualize them thank you thank you so much um, that was uh, super super interesting and already gave us a, a great uh. insight into oh, sorry into um, the the current challenges that, that we see um, that the reality poses to uh, a system that maybe is not uh, fit for for the current um, developments in, in data and how quickly it's it's produced and shared and um, uh, and then repurposed uh, eventually. Um, okay, moving on to uh, you had already mentioned um, policy is a little bit off, <laughs> so I think this fits perfectly to the next speaker. Um, who joins us online. Um, his name is uh, Thiago Mor Moraes. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, and he will uh, answer to a second policy question, which is, uh, there we see you. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, uh, and then we will answer, uh, or we'll I will ask you to um, address the second policy question, which is, how different regulators um, could or should approach challenges related to data sharing. And uh, Tiago is uh, from the um, Brazilian Data Protection Authority also, if I uh, get it right. So um, we will be looking forward to hearing your insights on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, yes. so thank you, Rosanna. And uh, I'd like to first of all thank uh, the Tony Blair Institute for this partnership on organizing this session. Uh, is the, uh, data sharing is definitely a very relevant topic more than ever, considering all the developments that we have been having with uh, not only in, in, in terms of technological innovation, but also uh, these new trends for regulation that are coming over from different regions. And uh, to answer this question, which, of course, uh, it's a very complex question. It would take way more than the six, seven minutes that I have. Uh, I decided to go with a specific use case uh, uh, that we had in Brazil regarding uh, data sharing in the context of GovTech. So I prepared a very small PowerPoint uh, presentation. Uh, maybe you could share it in the screen. Is that possible? Is it already shared? Uh, Luca, you, uh, it's Kevin, it's you it's it's yeah, OK. It's shared, yeah. It's shared. Um, but okay. I think it's not yet shared because we don't see it on the screen. So I think Could I share the one that I have with my, me or the one that was sent up to the organization? Um, uh, we have the presentation here, so we're just trying to uh, set it up now. Does it work? One, one moment, please. No, no problem. If that would make it easier, I can try to share from my Zoom screen as well. I don't know if that makes things easier or not. Um, I think you can definitely try at least if you have, I don't know if you have the correct rights, but um, if you, ah, okay, okay. that can was <laughs> great. Is it Perfect. Checking now? Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. That looks great. Okay. Yeah, you can see the presentation. Okay. okay. So yeah, uh, well, that was the question that was uh, asked for me to answer, right? And uh, I, as I said, I cannot answer for all kinds of regulators, but I can share a little bit of uh, the experience.
experience that we had as a data protection authority uh, following supervising a case uh, regarding uh, GovTech in Brazil. Uh, so what we have uh, in the executive branch, we have several ministries, and one of those ministries is currently engaged with innovation for the public sector, so GovTech uh, initiatives and so on, and to support this idea of creating an interoperability system that would share data between public entities, because that was the main idea of the project that they were developing. Uh, they, uh, this ministry, the, the Ministry of uh, Innovation Public Sector, uh, provide these, these rules in this decree that is mentioned here in, this, in 2019, right? And by the time it was uh, published, uh, the LGPD was still not yet enforced. The LGPD is the Brazilian Data Protection Law. Uh, but as soon as it came in force, it was very clear that there was a lot of inconsistencies uh, with this decree regarding with the data sharing rules that was required for the Brazilian Data Protection Law. It's very similar to the European model of the GBPR. So because of that, uh, and several other issues that were re related with this decree, because uh, it's provided, for example, for uh, this database, which supposedly was a huge database of all citizen data uh, collected from very different uh, governments' platforms. And for everyone who knows a little bit of that protection history, we know that many of the data protection laws and authorities have uh, so, uh, started due to the fact that, like, the having all the data of citizens' data with just one single entity is very, very dangerous. So this, of course, called a lot of attention. And uh, some entities, uh, private entities, uh, required uh, entered with a constitutional action, proceeded with a constitutional action at the Supreme, Brazilian Supreme Court. And this was a case uh, that followed from 2020 until 2022. And it's important to say that this only came in 2020 because that was also when the Brazilian Data Protection Law came into force. So it gives a lot of uh, room for uh, getting the discussion up to the Supreme Court. And the background case, was a data sharing that was happening in this platform that was being created between our intelligence agency and the transportation agency. Uh, and in the next slide, I'll make it more clear uh, what, what were the details of this case. But uh, just so you know, uh, we, we had here uh, several discussions that resulted in the, in the end uh, a manifestation of a court that there was several obligations that needed to be uh, changed in this decree because it was not fit to the purpose specification uh, principle of uh, the Brazilian data protection law. It didn't also provide for data minimization rules. Uh, it was not transparent of how these data share operations was, were happening. So because of all this that was missing, uh, the court decided uh, that a new, a new, new rules should be up updated so it could attend for all these requirements. And that's also at the same time, there was a committee that was supposed to manage all these data governance uh, rules, right, between this data sharing platform. And one criticism of this structure is because it was only composed by agents of the government. So this gave no room for civil society to pledge that their interests. So what happened is that with this new decree, these transparency rules and also rules that were uh, fit to the purpose specification principle and that minimization principle came into force in 2022. And also there was a restructuring of this comedy so this multi-ministerial committee, so before we only had like members from the government, they also added a layer for some civil society participants to be part of. So uh, this committee 
is the one that uh, is uh, has the role of deciding which questions regarding the integrity, the quality, and consistency of all this data that was being collected, was being uh, how how it would work. So all the data governance mechanisms, uh, and also what which kind of data might be included in this database. So basically, they they assume the role of a data steward here, right? Uh, as Esther was mentioning, this concept of data stewardship is very relevant in this uh, in this ecosystems of data sharing. And this committee uh, was the one supposed to doing doing this job. And by now, we have also members from civil society that can interview. It's still a bit uh, uneven, I would say, uh, how it's the composition, but at least now there is room because the members of the civil society, they can represent voice of several uh, civil society organizations that exist in Brazil. We even have a very strong coalition that you probably might see in other panels of the IGF because there are several members of these civil society organizations at the IGF. And because of that, they have voice to discuss and help supervising what is happening on the, on the decisions regarding how this data is being shared. And the Data Protection Authority, although it was not, did not have a, an active role in all of that because we were still growing in maturity, in the background, we assisted the Ministry uh, uh, of Innovation Public Sector sector to uh, approve this new decree that I mentioned that came with all these new rules. So we were helping them in the background uh, to make all, all these rules more compatible with our data protection law. And with that, we, we can see, of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, possibilities and opportunities that we can bring from this interoperability. That's why it's something that we, sh we couldn't just prohibit. That's why the Supreme Court decided that it was not going to prohibit the data sharing, but uh, making it happen in a compatible way with data protection principles and rules. And as we can see here, just these g 2 g, -G, -G APIs that exist in the context of this platform has saved uh, half a million dollars in these last years uh, because of the business, how data is being shared and, and the economy, the savings that it comes uh, for having these interoperability services running. And at the same time, of course, it's very important for attending to the principles of data minimization because uh, this avoids that uh, all the information is being shared with all the, the, the agency. So what we have right now in Brazil is that different ministries, when they require certain information, we have uh, this committee acting as a steward, and they're going to see if this sharing is happening, following all these principles that we uh, uh, I just mentioned, and guaranteeing that only the necessary information is being shared. Uh, of course, this is still a work in progress in the sense that uh, there's still uh, need to check uh, how the comedy is doing its work. Like, uh, but it's interesting to see that the case was so relevant that it reached the Supreme Court and it came with the decision quite fast for what, what we used in, in Brazil because of the relevance of these this activities of data sharing for uh, creating more efficiency to the public sector, but at the same time, of course, needing to respect all the data protection principles and fundamental rights. And that's it for my presentation. I hope it, I didn't take that long, but uh, if you need me for the second round, I'll be here. Thank you so much, uh, Tiago. That was super insightful. Um, and uh, yeah, um, it seems that you found uh, actually an interesting uh, a new way um, how to uh, handle the data that is uh, requested um, um, by the government from citizens. 
Um, and this actually brings us already to the next policy question, the third one, and which looks a bit more at uh, uh, institutional models, so innovation. Um, and we heard already one, but um, there are many, many other ones. And the two uh, next speakers will be uh, explaining a bit more uh, their research and their views on uh, which new institutional models are best suited to support innovation around data, while also at the same time uh, ensuring the protection of fundamental rights uh, such as privacy. Um, and for that, um, I will invite first uh, Kevin um, from the Tony Blair Institute uh, to give us his insights. And then I will pass it on to Dr. Alison Gilwald, um, who is joining us online. But first, um, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rosanna. Um, can I share the presentation on, the, on Zoom? Okay, enable. I think it says that it's disabled. I also want to like thank Thiago. I think at the institute we were called the your last slide uh, the proactive public services, or in the context of the strategic stay, meaning um, to exactly avoid this kind of waste of time for most citizens when we have to constantly fill forms. So good, like, lucky, lucky that uh, Brazilian citizens are quite lucky that you know you clear you guys are clearly on 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 the right track. And you know, as a side note, I will reach out to you uh, to kind of, kind of have, okay, oh good, a more in-depth understanding of it. Uh, I don't, I'm not able to share it. <laughs> Apologies to you. Thank you for your patience. Okay, wonderful. Can people see it? Uh, no. Uh, I'll try again, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm, one sec, no, how to do it. I mean, one, one second, sorry. Yeah, I'll just speak, okay. So, um, okay, I'll speak in the meantime. So what we've been trying to do at the Institute is to essentially make sense of the past 10 years um, in the, the, the data governance space. And at the beginning, like, two elements became quite clear and that I'm sure most people, you know, both in the on-site and the online audience are aware of are, first of all, the global proliferation of data localization laws and then the passing of very important privacy legislation with GDPR gradually becoming the gold standard uh, all over the world. But at the same time, we also quickly realized that that was only one part of the data governance story and that whilst these data localization laws were being passed throughout the globe, and whilst very important privacy legislation was being passed, a series of grassroots initiatives, such as the ones that Asta was describing, or um, Jack unfortunately couldn't join, but uh, a series of sort of pioneering institutions that the Open Data Institute began theorizing were also were also taking place, and were not necessarily, especially you know, like uh, around you know. The early, like around the early 2010, we're not actually getting the right attention from most policymakers, but uh, f like throughout throughout the last decade, we gradually we gradually we gradually got there. There's been a sort of process of sedimentation where these, these grassroots initiatives have gradually get like got more and more attention. And since we are in Japan, I think a very important, very important uh, milestone has been the Data Free Flows uh, with Trust initiative, which was part of the Osaka G20 um, like summer in 2019, and was then uh, repurposed for the uh, G7, uh, like as part of the Hiroshima process. So 
What we've been trying to do is to engage with, on one side, policymakers, data protection authorities, and on the other with uh, pioneering, I would say, uh, leading thinkers such as Asta and, and Jack that have begun this kind of work, have begun to actually uh, theorize and formalize, uh, experiment with the notion of, of data institutions. And we mean, by data institutions, we mean you know, data stewardship in the loser sense that, um, that one can imagine. And as part of, and we we'll then try to systematize this kind of reflections in a in a tube map, which I think you should be able to see uh, on the web. I don't think, yeah, I don't think uh, it's not on the website yet. Yeah, uh, so I guess we can just use it. Yeah, yeah. Is, um, can people see it like this? Yeah, okay. I think we'll just we'll just we'll just do it like that because otherwise we'll waste too much time. But anyway, we've been trying to um, we've been trying to systematize like our reflections in this tube map that you see here. Uh, so we've basically uh, like looked at all the data strategies throughout the globe. Uh, we've systematized like the the series of, of of stakeholder engagements that we've had, and we've put them on the map. Uh, and the reason you know there's a there's a reason for that, and it's that uh, my personal view is that mapping is in many ways, in many ways, uh, like helps visualize uh, something as like like the data sphere that can be quite quite arcane. So we see here like five like five different layers or or lines depends how you want to visualize it. The technology one, the regulatory one, the data infrastructure one, the physical one, and institutional one. Now like. It, this is by no means exhaustive, and it's uh, again we've, we had to we had to sim simplify by economy of time. But what's been what's kind of come out very clearly is that the institu institutional component is the one that actually requires most of the work, most of the work, like particularly in terms of conceptualizing what the, what these data institutions can mean. I mean, like Asa was referring to, like data cooperatives. We know that. And again, sometimes we have forgotten it as policymakers. There's a long tradition in the study of commons. You know, one can think of, for example, Nobel Prize winner like Eleanor Rostrom, uh, that has dedicated her whole life to to, to the study of uh, of of commons and like the management of commons, like completely sort of demystifying the myth of this so-called tragedy of the commons. And you know, it is quite different in the data space because in many ways we are not dealing, we're not dealing with uh, finite resources. Data is a non-rivalrous, uh, that is non-rivalrous. And that's why the sort of earlier narratives around like equating data as oil have been profoundly damaging because uh, they have been obscuring Again, these grassroots, grassroots initiatives, and in general, there have been there have been obscuring like a, a potential a potential different model. And at the same time, uh, I think that as part of the sedimentation process, uh, the conversations that like Asta was talk with, was talking about and was referring to, like gradually got to the policy level. It did take quite some time. Um, I know some of my friends in Brussels, in reference to the EU data governance sector, you were uh, referring to, like, kind of. We, we I remember one time we did have a debate about whether the EU was uh, sort of had been had arrived there too early or too late and i definitely think it got there like too late but i think the data governance act is a very important step in terms of uh, actually giving prominence to an alternative way of of steward of like providing uh, providing an institutional framework to steward data because like uh, we need to you know like the context that we're dealing with now is that the way data is also is produced is very is, is very different like we can have far more agency like data is now produced by internet things like if we were wearables like by 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 items such as wearables by the cloud on the edge like there is a, a huge part of the data ecosystem that is actually not necess doesn't necessarily have to go through large tech companies and we do need institutional models that empower people uh, and give agency to people uh, to use this data for for the aims that they deem like suitable or that they they deem like closest to their um, 
on their sensitivity. And you know, I, I don't want to go too much into detail about the EU governance act, but you see here like the four mo the, the four main elements that I think are really important. The first one is the reuse of data held by public sector bodies, which will be really important, especially for AI development. Um, being Essentially, uh, again, this covers a policy vacuum because the Open Data Directive of the EU uh, was covering, well, was legislating very like thoroughly about uh, essentially known known personal known personal data. But at the same time, public public authorities have a lot of personal protected data, uh, and which could not be could not be really used. And you know, with with the Governance Act, we will see how it goes. It will actually it will start to be applicable from this month onwards. So the panel is in quite good timing. We'll see how that's gonna go. And then like the point like two and three, actually certifying like data intermediaries and data altruism, like giving them the prominence that they haven't had in the past. Um, so in, and in particular, I wanna concentrate on like data altruism, which uh, has, has been the result of a of a, of a lot of advocacy work, particularly like I, I can think of uh, the European Association of Rare Diseases, because rare diseases are like a classic textbook example where data sharing is proportionally valuable because it's very difficult to build um, a data set that is large enough for, for rare disease for, for it to actually be significant and useful for research. So uh, they've been at the forefront in terms of advocacy work for the EU to actually provide a mechanism that can empower, um, like for example, like people that suffer from rare disease to actually, pr with, you know, with their consent, um, to you know being able to to share the data for like research purposes so the fact that we now have this institutional framework which again can be debated uh we can debate like how uh, you know how effective it's going to be my my the concern that i have in particular with data altruism is that it's so like particularly in europe it's so associated with um contact tracing apps like during COVID. So there is an element, I think there's a political element because uh, obviously those apps became extremely politicized, but also I think there's almost a, a psychological element because COVID in many ways has been such a psychological trauma for most people. And I do think that we are in a sort of phase of almost like denial about it where we don't want to talk about it. And my fear is that these, kind of, these emotions will affect quite a lot. Uh, these uh, actually the, the effectiveness of like this framework for data altruism. So I do think we need uh, quite a political campaign uh, to promote data altruism uh, given the broader context. Uh, but these are just like few thoughts about like our the work that we've been doing. Like we're very much open to engage with uh, again grassroots initiatives, data protection authorities, think tanks, and I do invite the online audience to to reach out because uh, it's very much work in progress and uh, thank you all for your attention. And now I think we can move to Alison for the concluding remarks. Yes, exactly. Thanks uh, first of all to you, Kevin, uh, for your insights and also giving us a bit the um, the policies, so to say, perspective of what already happens um, in Brussels and also elsewhere. And and actually also I will um, invite everyone to consult the map. I think it's on Twitter. It's not published yeah. yet, uh, as you said, but um, the, the tube map, so to say, of data is also a great way of, again, visualizing the many, many ways in which data can be shared, um, also in a privacy-friendly way. Um, okay, with that, uh, I'll hand it over to um, Alison uh, Gilwald. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Um, you would be joining us also uh, online, and you are with the Research ICT Africa. So, Dr. Alison Gilwald, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I, I suppose my answer will cut across all those three very interesting questions um, and, and not focus only on, on innovation. Um, partially because a lot of the uh, kind of lobbying around um, uh, data extractivism and getting, you know, um, uh, unprotected kind of access to data has really been around this kind of commercial experimentation and innovation and the kind of, um, you know, dominance that certain groups have to these. So I think um, the you know, issues of data sharing are really um, significantly um, about, you know, these asymmetrical power relations that we have um, between <laughs> North and South, different countries, and of course, within, within countries themselves. But so I, I, you know, I think 
uh, we want to set up a, a, um, a, a policy framework, an environment that allows for the benefits of um, shared data. Um, and as I said, there, you know, in policy, there are, um, you know, expounded benefits of, of, of public data and getting value, you know, the value of public data. And um, Tiago has spoken very interestingly about the Brazilian um, um, stewardship that's happened around public data. Um, but I think uh, speaking specifically from the African context, the first thing we have to do is just acknowledge um, the uh, complete lack of access to data. So a lot of the frameworks that are being used across, you know, uh, we've been sort of cutting and pasting in many other parts of the world, um, assume that, you know, we have large people's of pe numbers of people online, the majority of people online, that there is universal access um, to services, to, to, you know, government services and data. So I think the first, you know, <laughs> important thing about data sharing is acknowledging that the you know the, the the asymmetrical power relations that go with that. If you've um in a position to uh, hold lots of data, you're in a much stronger position to negotiate how that's used or negotiate that it's not used at all. You don't have access to it at all, which I will will come back to in a moment. But I do think um you know uh, just referring to um, both what Asta has, has said um um and Thiago that uh you know the uh, current regimes which are important to ensure um, data protection and, and you know, privacy of personal data need to be understood also in the um, context of broader data governance. Um, and that, you know, uh, the current uh, sort of negative regulation that we have, basically, um, you know, compliance regulation, um, quite individualized notions of only first generation rights, as, as just said, really need to be understood in terms of the um, development imperatives of, of collective or more um, um, you know, public um, common good kind of rights that you might need um, in, in your data policy frameworks. And I'm uh, referring specifically to, you know, the uh, kind of dust data justice frameworks that we've been trying to do um, develop within um, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, but also that we carry through in the work that we've um, supported, the, the technical assistance we've provided to the African Union um, data policy framework, which, you know, unlike um, GDPR or, you know, even some of the later legislation that's, that's coming out at the moment, but, you know, tries to um, extend the uh, regulatory concerns or the policy concerns from simply those, uh, you know, first generation rights concerns primarily with privacy to, to, to second and third generation rights. So actually ensuring, um, the, you know, economic um, and, and even third generation environmental um, rights are collectively enjoyed while those first very important privacy and first protection, uh, uh, first generation rights are, are ensured. Um, and this really goes to um, uh, you know important part of managing data within a particularly in an African context, but I think uh, globally too, which is not only about um, uh, ensuring the you know redress of the uneven distribution currently of uh, harms from from da these data driven technologies, but also the uneven um, distribution of opportunities. So, you know, basically what we've got is these enormously asymmetrical um, data flows outside of the continent, 80% of data flows outside the continent, uh, roughly proportion 20 in. Um, and then, of course, within countries, as I said, large numbers of people simply, um, simply offline. So ensuring that, you know, that there is uh, an environment that can, ensure, that can benefit um, Africans and um, uh, you know, citizens, and also, um, you know, in, in terms of engaging internationally, that we might have a, a, a bigger uh, influence if we can get the kind of economies of scale and scope that you need for data. Um, within the African continental uh, free trade area, there there is a big, well, at, area in the context of the African Union data policy framework, there's a big push for us to at least ensure um, flows and interoperability of data for, for, for research, for sharing, for public purposes, for finance, transactions, et cetera, at least on the continent. And this would allow us some sort of leverage, um, uh, you know, um, in terms of international um, uh, flows and in and, and international markets, um, quite honestly. So these are uh, sort of important considerations that 
um, you know, I think we, we were speaking a little bit about, you know, how at the moment it's a kind of governance framework and it's quite difficult to regulate. It's obviously very difficult to enforce. Um, but the potential of harmonization through the African continental free trade area would provide the kind of interoperability that would allow for um, flows of data and, of course, specifically shared data um, that currently Africa has very uneven access to and could uh, really promote, which we do very strongly within the African continental, sorry, within the African Union data policy framework, um, the idea of, uh, you know, um, a, a greater uh, interoperability, a single market, and um, the uh, use of the data for development, and very strongly the the idea that of, of course, unleashing data for, for um, commercial value creation, but very importantly also for um, public value creation. Most, a lot of the data that does exist in Africa is is, is bound in, in public, um, uh, you know, in public entities, um, and you know, did, firstly, digitizing that. A lot of that is not digitalized in Africa, and that's a big problem. But secondly, enabling this data to to flow um, for uh, you know public value creation, um, as well as you know commercial value creation, is, is a quite important aspect of this. And so there are aspects of open open data requirements, for example, within a, a protected environment, um, in the in the um, framework that are that are proposed. Um, and also the uh, acknowledgement that we also need to um, 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 access the public data that is available in held by private companies. And um, in this regard, one can, you know, in terms of data sharing, we also have um, another project uh, through the Action Coalition on Transparency, GNI, um, which is also trying to get equitable access for um, African researchers uh, in the first instance to the kind of requirements that um, uh, the Digital Services Act makes of uh, a big tech companies for European um, uh, researchers. And I think, you know, the importance of, of extending these kinds of rights um, is critical to not perpetuating the fact that we, you know, to access resources, to act access knowledge systems, um, African researchers um, and intellectuals have to uh, you know, work through European or Northern Hemisphere um, uh, researchers with access to data. Uh, even the uh, informal system set up um, uh, by Google for um, accessing data is set up through Michigan University with a number of accredited people throughout the world, um, very few in Africa, three, two in Ghana and three or four in South Africa, um, to get that kind of access. So, you know, uh, at the moment, you know, calls for kind of just, you know, uh, opening up data um, out of kind of very unregulated environments, just allowing the free flow of data, um, in our view, would very much perpetuate the status quo, would allow those with already, um, you know, uh, dominant uh, positions in markets, in research institutions, in various things, to um, gain that access, whereas, whereas others um, um, may not. So these are... Um, uh, various uh, mechanisms, these are various uh, you know, institutional arrangements, these are various regulatory um, interventions that we believe are necessary not to just, you know, not, not to um, uh, have a sort of compliant safeguards regime, but it actually would ensure um, not only safe outcomes, but actually just, more just outcomes. Um, and I think that's a really sort of important part of looking at this, that it's, of course, these alternative data stewardship models are very important because the big, you know, kind of informed consent kind of models aren't working. But you, we're not going to solve the, the scale of the problems with, you know, micro solutions, um, uh, you know, for different kinds of communities. We really do need, uh, you know, strong um, regulation of these digital public goods um, and global, you know, governance and cooperation on ensuring um, enforcement of the, you know, big tech companies that are, are holding a lot of this data, um, ensuring that we've got enabling environments in our um, regional jurisdictions or in our in our countries um, to uh, safeguard citizens' opportunities, but also to create local opportunities, you know, through. Um, entrepreneurial access to public data through the better use of public data by 
governments um, you know, more, more effectively servicing their citizens um, and then you know enabling us to uh, create viable uh, data economies and data markets by having a um, not only you know as I said safe um, and 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 um, secure data economy but also having ones that are that are more just. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, that was uh, super insightful and also I think um, has taught us a lot about how data, um, open data and data access is actually quite uh, still unequal around the world if we say, well, the EU already has a wonderful framework in place, but then if we look at Africa, there's a completely different um, uh, ecosystem and, and also conditions um, that need to be respected when people or governments think about how, th that how they can e enable or or increase access to, to data sharing. Okay, um, that brings us uh, to the end of the speaker's um, presentations. We have three minutes left for questions. Um, so uh, I will uh, also check online if we have any questions at all um, from the online audience. And um, I will also ask the online moderator to flag if there are any questions regarding Lee. Um, and if not, um, I will also look around the room and, and see if there are any questions um, that people would like to ask. Yes, the microphone, please, yeah. So uh, my question is just kind of... Could you quickly also oh, please introduce yourself? Sorry, yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm Pete Furlong. I'm a colleague of Kevin at, at the Tony Blair Institute. Um, but my question is kind of... You know, there's, there's a lot of focus on the mechanisms and frameworks and policies that need to be in place um, to support, uh, like, you know, effective data sharing. Um, but I think something that's, like, maybe often missed is kind of the enforcement capacity um, that's sort of needed to support that. Um, I look to, like, the U.S. is, like, maybe a good example of kind of a place where we've struggled with that, um, you know, we do actually have uh, some data protection laws in the U.S., especially when it comes to things like medical data. Uh, how well enforced those things are is, you know, kind of maybe in question. Um, so I think, you know, maybe just a question for the panelists in terms of how they think about, you know, the importance of enforcement and, and kind of what that should look like. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't see f at the moment any other questions from the online audience, so I would uh, hand this back to the speakers, both um, in the room and also online. Um, I don't know if there's anyone online that would like to uh, quickly intervene. If not, maybe we can go first and then we can see if there's someone online. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is a conversation I was having outside yesterday as well is that I think what we're realizing is that so many laws are being developed and such a breakneck speed that we haven't really thought about implementation and I think to your point of did it came, come too soon or too late it's likely also too late and what what we've been also thinking about at APTI is that how do we build processes uh, of consultation early on in the in the development of the laws so that there's increased buy-in so that you can you know understand what the implementation opportunities are for different stakeholders we've learned this from GDPR that actually implementation is a real nightmare uh, the companies that have the big lawyers can you know work around it but the ones that don't actually have to leave the 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 EU so I think that what what we've seen, and in, in this is an example from India, is that our telecom regulatory authority was built on the back of private sector demand and incredible amounts of consultation. And what ended up happening is that all of these values are then coded into the institution itself that has been set up for success in some ways. So um, they, because the private sector was bought in, civil society was bought in, because you know people understood how they needed to work together through the process of building out. And I've become a big votary of building institutions through these pos possibly inefficient and prolonged processes. But what it helps do then, uh, and we've done this analysis across different regulatory authorities, is that it makes implementation and enforcement much easier because of that multi-stakeholderism from the very beginning. I mean, I think, like, considering we have a, an actual regulator in, in, as part of the panel, uh, I guess, like, Thiago, you would like to answer about, like, on enforcement? Yeah, sure. I. I Although I'm not part of the enforcement team, uh, I know a lot 
uh, about the work. And what what I can tell is that, uh, first of all, uh, before even enforcement comes, it's it's very important to to have this uh, sharing of knowledge, right? Be, be, besides the data sharing itself, uh, sharing how uh, data uh, data regulate data protection regulation, data governance regulations in general work. I think it's very important first step. Uh, and uh, I, we can give uh, our case as an example because in Brazil before the LGPD, not many people have had heard. And I, I would dare say that even today, there's still not as many as we would like to uh, are aware about what are the data subject rights, what are the data protection principles, etc. So sharing this uh, with the regulator with the citizens, data subjects, etc., is very important. So you can people can be empowered about their rights, and uh, the, the data controllers, processors are aware of, of what are the obligations, how they should comply to. After this, this happens, the work for enforcement it it, it gets way more easier because uh, after uh, this knowledge is shared about how rules on data protection works. We, we have more easiness to guarantee compliance, for example, for notification of data breach, uh, for uh, coming initiative, uh, receiving initiatives that are already like privacy compliance. So uh, just like the example I was given, uh, there was a, a huge difference after the authority was created for this GovTech experience because uh, even though we are not part of that committee that I mentioned, we have worked in the background. And it's important to explain why we are not part of the committee, because the committee is, uh, are data controllers, because they are the stewards in this case. So we could not be part of that committee, right? But we were working in the background and, and, and sharing information with them. So instead of trying to enforce uh, sanctions or any, any kind of more traditional role of regulator uh, adopting this approach of sharing knowledge first was a way of making things steering things to the uh, right way let's say like that uh, and that's the experience that we have been having here in our authority uh, actually so far we only had two sanctions one was just uh, enforced like uh, last week and uh, since it was for a public uh, body and it was not a very grave case, it was just like, a, uh, I forgot how to say, a warning. It was a warning uh, because it, it was a way of calling attention. And it's a first step because if the, the, what the, the, the public body was doing what was not corrected, then of course we can suspend the data sharing, the activities, the data processing they were doing. Thank you. Thank you for your insights, Yeah, um, um, Two very, very good points um, already on, on the point of enforcement. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to add anything. Um, Perhaps yes. I could just, um, Please if go I ahead. could just on the enforcement issue. Um, I think it's a very important question, and I, I, I was uh, raising it as a, a challenge for us currently um, in the uh, um, broader data governance environment that we're in. I think, as as Tiago points out, I think um, many of us have some of the data protection regulation enforcement, which can happen at the national level um, under, under control. What we don't have is this broader data governance issue. So I think we certainly on the continent, um, for example, we have a very strong um, data protection and information regulator in South Africa, also responsible for access to information, which is a very nice balance to have um, in terms of balancing rights, um, who's acted you know, strongly against WhatsApp and various groups. So I think a, a strong, informed, democratically um, you know, institutionalized um, um, uh, um, 
a protect data protect can can operate effectively. I think what we're really struggling with is the broader concept of data governance that I was speaking to about before, um, in terms of uh, you know who actually creates the you know who's actually going to be doing some of the economic regulation. So there's some obvious like competition regulation etc that happens within the competition authority and some you know underlying um, issues in 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 various other um, regulators. But actually combining that in terms of you know, uh, creating, uh, you know, uh, an enabling environment for local innovation, creating an in environment for um, access to public data for um, entrepreneurs, etc. That I think these big um, uh, economic justice issues or economic regulation issues are, are far more challenging. And then, of course, I think the, the biggest challenge is actually the um, international regulation and getting that the big data that we all want um, from, you know, from from the from the big operators. And as I said, I think they're the only way we can address this is through global governance and global cooperation around, you know, equitable access to that data, not the preferential decisions being made by the the, the tech companies themselves of who gets, uh, you know, who 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 they share their data with. Um, so I think that that's really the challenge for us is that that global cooperation and perhaps just to add one other thing to us this point on you know trying to build um multi-stakeholder public participatory processes for these which i think um you know brazil india south africa have all been quite um committed to and have a history of in the telecommunication sector um firstly don't translate it certainly across the african continent there's a absence of civil society participation in many of the public processes and it's not required by, in terms of administrative law or justice in many of those countries so it's very very absent um and i think i think i still would agree and i think it was implicit in what you were saying while it had opened up these um institutions that were theoretically autonomous anyway and um you know uh, able to uh, get multi-stakeholder participation in them in fact the 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 private sector the telecom companies have been so powerful as the tech companies have been in these public processes that it you know very often their interests are they are, are the outcomes that we we see in these processes so really trying to enforce you know public participation um, and resource um, you know, researchers in order to access that information, they can inform these processes. You can have you know multiple um, views on this that are enjoyed in many of the more mature economies around these public processes would be an important part of accessing that data and sharing that data in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Yeah, that would have also been one of my questions, but unfortunately, we're already eight minutes over time. <laughs> so I think that just uh, says that we had a very good discussion and very insightful um, uh, yeah, um, points that we were uh, able to exchange today. So I would like to thank everyone, um, especially again to the Tony Blair Institute for hosting us and to all the speakers, both in on-site and online, for joining us. Um, as I also said, we have shared a lot of uh, resources. Please do access them and also please do get in touch with uh, all the speakers if you would like to discuss this topic further. And um, yeah, for those uh, present, see you around at the IDF and for those online, see you the next time. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening slash day. <laughs> Bye.